Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I have Christy Clemens Hoffman joining me today. We're going to be talking all about how energy affects the body and how we affect others' health with beliefs and everything that is in my wheelhouse that I love so much about energy work and our energy bodies. So a little bit about Christy before we get started. Christy Clemens Hoffman is the host of the Radiant Wellness Podcast, bringing authors, thought leaders, and other inspirational guests to an international audience with guests such as Dr. Raymond Moody, Whitley Stryberg, Dr. Eben Alexander, and Marie Diamond. She is also co-author of the best-selling book, The Gap, Simple Steps to Reclaim Your Health and Reverse Most Chronic Diseases, as well as a lifelong intuitive channel, teacher, coach, and consultant whose passion is assisting others to see who and what they truly are using quantum healing hypnosis technique, QHHT, and other forms of hypnosis, Reiki, angel readings, medical intuition, channeling, mediumship, and Akashic records. Christy helps clients with questions about their spiritual growth, unlocking answers about life purpose, past lives, health, relationships, and more. Christy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having me. So excited to have you. And I'm really excited about this conversation. As everybody knows, um, I'm an intuitive energy healer myself. So it's always fun to have a fellow energy healer on board on the show to talk about everything energy and really dive into, you know, how our energy system works and how everything affects us and holding on to those thoughts, emotions, beliefs, and trauma, you know, can actually cause disease. But before, before we jump way into that, I want you to start with what was your journey to here? Like, how did health and divorce play a role as you talk about in that beautiful chapter you wrote in the book? Oh my goodness. This is the $64,000 question. I usually ask somebody to buy me a beer before I launch into this, <laughs> but <laughs> how I got here is very, um, I think it's very typical because I grew up being intuitive and, you know, we all are, we all come into this world with a highly developed intuition, whether we choose to develop it or we uh, don't use it at all. We have those choices. And I had no idea growing up in the in late 60s, early 70s, I had no idea what that what it was, that it was a thing, that it was desirable, that it was um, anything out of the ordinary, because it's just how I was. Um, grew up seeing ghosts, seeing energy and knowing things. So clear with clear cognizance. And it was a kind of a confusing thing, actually, because I grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City, where we were very white bread, very straight laced, very suburban. And you just didn't talk about those kind of things. And, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit. I'd always been interested. And so I, I read, I studied I as much as I could. I, when I meet, met people, I wanted to learn more about this whole metaphysical side and this whole different type of life and lifestyle. So I learned as much as I could. Along the way, um, I'd gotten married. And um, when that marriage came to an end, I was looking for meaning. And as you do, I started Googling because we had the internet by then. Started Googling karma, past lives. There's got to be some bigger answer to this whole thing. Found Dolores Cannon and found about past life regression. And I'd heard about this these type of things before, but I didn't know very much. And come to find out that Dolores Cannon was in Arkansas. Dolores Cannon, her picture is right above my head here in my office. Um, but she was in Arkansas and she was doing this specialized type of past life regression and just answering all types of questions about karma, relationships, anything you'd want to know. And I thought, that's very interesting. And I called her office and I said, yes, I'd like to schedule an appointment with Dolores Cannon for this thing that she does. And they said, well, she's booked up for four years. And so they referred me to this website to find somebody else because she had just started teaching. And I found somebody in Kansas City. My husband and I both went and neither one of us got very far with it because turns out the, the therapist was not doing it the way that she intended and the way that she taught it. But he referred me to someone else who does readings, intuitive readings. And I went to her and I had a fantastic reading. I sent 
all my friends to her as well. And I learned some things that really gave me answers and put into context all the things that I had been experiencing growing up. She started teaching to do the things that she was doing. She taught mediumship and angels and how to connect with spirit and all of these things. I took all of the classes that she would teach. And pretty soon I started working with people myself and delivering messages to them from their guides, their angels, their loved ones. And I was meeting a lot of people in this space. There's a lot of folks in Kansas City in the metaphysical community. And I was meeting a lot of people and many of them were doing energy work. I'd never heard of that. This was in the early 2000s. I had never heard of that, but I thought I should learn this as well. And took Reiki one, two, three, and master, took all of that. And then uh, along the way, I had been working in a corporate job. I was working at a major publishing house here in Kansas City. And then I left there and went to Hallmark, which was which is headquartered here in Kansas City. Always been my dream to work at Hallmark. And I was there about a year and got laid off with a thousand other people. We all got laid off. Yeah. And they paid for entrepreneurial classes. I took entrepreneurial classes and learned how to open a business and how to start a business. By then, I figured out that I wanted to start a wellness center, a wellness collaborative. I had been doing readings out of a physical space that was a wellness collaborative in the Kansas City area. There was shamanism, astrology. There were uh, intuitives and psychics and energy healers and many, many things under one roof. And I thought it was just the coolest concept, but then it imploded about the same time that I got laid off. And I decided I wanted to open my own, but with more integrity and more intention, intentionality. And I didn't have the capital to launch a, a physical brick and mortar place. So I decided to do it online. So I formed radiate wellness and Radiate Wellness is a collaborative. There's three practitioners, um, both here in Kansas City and also Geneva, Switzerland. And our office is basically the website. So, you know, when COVID hit, I was glad we didn't have a physical space because we would have lost our shirts in that. But um, it's been working out very well so far. And then I started the podcast, the Radiate Wellness podcast. And you, of course, were, were a guest. But anyway, at the, the week that I started Radiate Wellness, I went down to Eureka Springs, Arkansas and studied QHHT, quantum healing hypnosis technique, Dolores's method of hypnosis that she developed over 40 years. And I don't know what I was thinking, taking a week long class out of town and launching a, a website at the same, all in the same week, but here we are. And I rose in the levels of QHHT. I added on other forms of hypnosis and there we are. Here we are today. <laughs> so it's kind of a long story how to get here, but you know, all of the things that I do, all the things that you do, they're all just different points on the same spectrum. They're all combining to improve people's lives. 100%. That's how 100%. Has, um how has the hypnosis technique really benefited your work that you do? Oh, wow. How is it not? Um, well, you know, from the very beginning, when I was simply doing readings out of my home and out of this wellness center, it was all about, I was all about giving people homework to do. It's like, yes, you can do this stuff too. And if we're talking about improving your life, which I think we are, then there are some things that you need to be working on too. You can't just depend on folks like me to solve all your problems. Can I help? Yes. And I can hold the mirror and I can give you information for you to make informed decisions. But always, always, I wanted to empower the client. And that's what QHHT really does. It puts you in touch with your higher self. It shows you pertinent other lifetimes so that you can take that information and make changes in your life. You learn from your higher self answers to many questions that we hold. Well, you learn, you can learn in QHHT how to connect with your higher self. Most people ask about that. So it en enhances people's lives in so many different ways. And 
I, I call it the big kahuna of all the things that I do because it really does incorporate everything. And of course I do readings and Reiki as well and have many clients for that, but QHHT is really the one-stop shop. It sounds like it would really bring everything together that you do in a really lovely workable way, especially like seeing into the aura and the chakras and past lives as we do. And like speaking of people normally don't think of their energetic system when they're thinking about their health. Like we're not taught that in school. We're talk about, we're told about our physical systems, right? So let's talk about our energetic system and how that works with our physical inner systems. Absolutely. Well, as you and your listeners know, the energy system is comprised of the chakras the major chakras, the primary, and also the minor chakras as well, and the aura. So this is basically the energy that's in our body, just organized in a way that we can understand it. And the energy in our bodies, I think that that's the part of us that's God, the part of us that's eternal, because the energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed. It just continues. And that energy in our body really controls the whole thing because that's the part of us that we take with us. And our energy system comprised of the seven principal chakras, um, each of the chakras, as you know, as your viewers know, or your listeners know, um, governs different belief systems, emotional um, presets, emotional qualities, so that our thoughts and our beliefs as we move through life, our emotions as well, affect the energy field according to the vibration of that thought, that belief, or that emotion. For example, thoughts and beliefs around, I just don't have a voice in this situation. This directly applies to the throat chakra, which is all about speaking up and all about having a voice. So when we believe that, well, I'm not going to speak up, nobody ever listens to me, or why would they want to listen to me? Well, that's going to affect us energetically. And we'll start to have some emotions around that. We might feel sad. We might feel frustrated and might feel angry about, for example, not being able to communicate or not feeling heard or not feeling like we have a voice. And that's going to affect our throat chakra primarily. But this is true of the whole body. All of our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs all affect some part of our energy field. Every emotion corresponds to its appropriate chakra. Negative emotions are a clear indicator that there's there's something going on. A negative emotion tells us, hey, dummy, you need to look at this. You might not be looking at it in the right way. Maybe you should think about changing your beliefs and your attitudes about it. So that's our first sign that there's something wrong. We have free will and we can either choose to do something about it, change our attitude, change our thoughts and beliefs, look at the the situation differently, or we can choose not to do anything at all. And that's fine. But if we choose not to address it, then that knock needs to get a little bit louder. And then our higher self, our eternal, the eternal part of us, who we really are, wants to make that knock a little bit louder. And then we'll feel off. We may get insomnia. We may feel very depressed. We may just feel something's just not right. And a lot of us are walking around saying, something not right and I'm not really sure what it is. So, and again, we can choose at that point, are we going to change course? Are we going to change direction or are we going to stay the course? And if we stay the course, we don't do anything at all, then it's still there that those thoughts, those negative beliefs and those negative emotions are still there and they're working on us. And eventually it'll wind up in the body as physical disease, as injury even, or illness, it'll show up in the body. So for example, cancer is usually begun with anger. And I haven't seen any cancer in any of my clients. And of course, I'm not a medical doctor. I am not anywhere in the medical field, but um, I know the energy of the body. And I've not seen anyone who is on a cancer journey who's not got 
anger that may be feeding that. And all kinds of different issues in the body begin with the thoughts and emotions. Another example, and our language tells us about this. Our language is really great about giving us indications. For example, we talk about shouldering the burden, or I've got a, uh, I got a shoulder, the, like I bear it on my shoulders. So I was getting ready to set up for an event. I had just gotten to this event and I had cases and cases of materials in my car and someone was supposed to meet me to help me carry it all in because there was no, there were tons of stairs and no elevators at the venue. And they didn't show for the longest time. So I had to carry all this stuff in and I was resentful about it. I was angry about it. And the next day I noticed I couldn't move my shoulder. I had frozen shoulder. And in that case, it was instantaneous more or less, but usually it takes a number of months or years for these things to develop. I think maybe because I am in this field it might show up quicker. And I had to deal with that shoulder issue for a long time. And I realized where it started and I started forgiving. I started changing my attitude. It's like, you know, I could have issued a reminder. I could have asked someone else to help. I could have grabbed somebody to help me. So I started to think of all of the ways that, that my thinking about that situation was just not in alignment. And, you know, between correcting the thoughts and beliefs and actually seeking out physical therapy and chiropractic. I did heal it, but I had to go through it first. Thank you for uh, sharing that because that is a great example of walking yourself through it. And it's that awareness. Okay. I'm experiencing this thing and then uncovering through awareness, what that block is. Okay. You know, what am I possibly not seeing if it's something to do with the eyes or what am I shouldering right now if it's something to do with the shoulders? And I know that there's many spiritual teachers that have been talking about this since the 80s, probably before, but it's just now coming into mainstream where science is really starting to prove it that, you know, we do have a reason for all these aches and pains in our bodies and dis-ease, as we like to say, right, from these emotional blocks. Absolutely. And that's what my chapter in the gap is about, is that, um, in fact, I have a graphic that I put in the chapter, and that's of a, a, a mountain. You know, I used to live in Switzerland, and we have mountains, we have tunnels through our mountains. We put, it's like, we're not going to put a road around this. We're going to dig right through the tunnel, right through the mountain. We're going to make our, our road. So I imagined whatever we're dealing with, an illness or disease or even an injury that we sustained as that mountain. And we want to dig through it to find relief. But on one side of that mountain, we're applying physical things, physical therapy and chiropractic and x-rays and medications when warranted. We're doing the physical things for a physical body. But on the other side of that mountain, we're working on the energetic causes and the emotional uh, presets and beliefs that helped co-create this issue. And what we wanna do is apply both at the same time and meet in the middle so that we can achieve healing. If we only do the physical stuff, we might get there, but it could very well come back because we're not dealing with the with the core and we're not dealing with the root. If we're only looking at the energetic and the emotional, we'll get there, but it's taken 30 years for this to develop. It could take just as long to correct course and, and undo it. So it's really very wise in my estimation to look at both in especially on high stakes healing journeys. I, you know, I'm working with several people who have cancer right now. And we talk about how I would never tell anybody, don't do your chemo, don't do your radiation. This is, it's going to help you in the long run, but you've got to address forgiveness. You've got to address the origins and release anger while you're doing that because you're going to have much better results that way. And you're going to have peace. And that's really peace. I cannot, cannot overestimate peace because 
if we just have peace and relaxation, that already starts us on healing. So I'm always going to advocate. It's like, let's just get you to a place where you're okay. Because I hate to see anybody lingering and hanging out in anger or resentment. Yeah, same. Better to learn ways to process through all of those emotions than to hold on to them. And once we learn those anger release exercises or ways that we can move these blocks through our bodies, then we set forward later, you know, when the little things start coming and we're like, okay, deal with this now. So I'm not dealing with a full bucket of emotions later, right? Right. Absolutely. You know, I have people coming in for QHHT in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and their high self says, you know, you never really dealt with that one thing. And the people's higher, higher selves have told them, you have to feel it. You've not even allowed yourself to feel the thing. And until you feel it, you can't heal it. You can't go right to the healing. You got to go through the messiness to get there. I hear people. I hear people's higher selves tell them that all the time. Now, again, the higher self can go through and clear things and remove things for people, but they always want you to have the emotion and have the learning, have the have the lesson first. It's important. And, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Have the lesson first because we're not going through these things for nothing. Like we're going right. through these things so we can learn to process it. It's not about like, oh, I have this emotion and now I'm going to sweep it under the rug. You know, and you've got this pile underneath the rug that you're dealing with, right? It's like, okay, you have this emotion. You have to deal with it. And so often in the past, like that was the old paradigm is that we didn't deal with our emotions. You know, we would move or, you know, leave relationships or just pretend like everything is fine and nothing's going on and nobody's ever dealing with anything. And it's beautiful now how everybody's becoming emotionally aware these days and aware that we need to really work on our emotions. We're having these emotions for a reason. We need to process these emotions. And then if we don't, we're ending up with aches and pains and everything else. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Because we're ultimately all responsible. We're all responsible for our own healing. You know, and I've got something up on my wall. I'm looking at it. it says your wound is not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. Because, I mean, it, this empowers us to own our emotions, own our illness, own our disease, even own our accidents and injuries to own it and say, not in a way to blame someone, but to say, okay, well, what is your contribution to this situation? How could you have contributed and maybe pulled this into your life? What is it teaching you? You know, when I got, I got laid off from Hallmark, my mantra was, this is not happening to me. It's happening for me, which is a huge shift. When we can get to that place, the divorce, my husband cheating, my mom dying unexpectedly. When we can get to the place where we are able to calmly, if not emotionally, because of course there has to be that as well, but if we can get to the place where we can break it down and see what the contributing factors were, we're going to get so much out of it. And I'm all for that. What can we get out of this bad experience? Where's my learning? Yeah. And that's growth mindset. You know, right. we all go through these things. And when we're in that divorce, when we're processing that death, you know, we're in it and we're really feeling it. But if we can change that perspective to go, you know, okay, this is happening for me instead of to me, I'm not in this victim state anymore. How can I pull myself out of this? And instead of surviving these emotions for a lifetime, really turning them around and thriving instead. Hey, leaning into them, saying that I, right now I'm going to feel this right now. I'm going through it. It's not always going to be like this, but right now I need to explore this feeling. I've been going through kind of a personal thing, um, a silly personal thing in my, in my own life. And I've been 
dissecting a lot. It's a huge growth experience. And I could choose to say, yeah, this person was in the wrong. This person did not, had no concern for my safety or my well being. But no, because I was a willing participant in that and owning my emotions about it. And I've learned so much. It's amazing. Yeah, if we just give ourselves a chance, you know, give our emotions a chance, give ourselves the opportunity to process, to get curious about who we are and why we're experiencing these things. And then we uncover so much. Then the next time the lesson comes around, we have the tools to be able to deal with it, to handle it. You know, and one, it doesn't take us down. And two, we have that objective observer viewpoint of it where we see the big picture of everything and the purpose that it's coming in our lives again. And then what that offers us moving forward. Great, I agree. Do you know the teacher, Matt Kahn? I do. Yes, I want to get him. Yes, yes, I want to get him on my podcast. He's awfully busy, (laughs) but he's a wonderful teacher. His YouTube channel and his website are just full of his teachings and that he downloads from his higher power. But one of his big tenets is whatever arises, love that. So fear, I have fear about this next step I'm taking, for example. Thank you, fear, for showing up. Thank you for showing me where I need to feel secure, right? So anger comes up. Thank you, anger. Thank you for showing me where I need to forgive myself and forgive others, right? So whatever emotion arises, just love it. And that's been a game changer too, not just for me, but for my clients too, to take a deep dive and lean into it. Whoever tells you to lean into your anger, lean into your sadness. We want to do this responsibly. We don't want to take anything out on anybody. And we want to do this in a, you know, in a safe way, but lean into it and explore. What does it have to teach us? You can't heal it until you feel it. You got to feel it. Love that. (laughs) can't heal it until you feel it it's gonna be yeah. a new quote <laughs> you, know, you know here i'm here in the kansas city area i'm you know kansas city is one of these weird cities that straddles state lines but we're smack dab in the midwest and my standard joke is that us good midwestern women we stuff that we stuff our emotions we shove them down and that's so very typical for a lot of people in a way it's a badge of honor it's like well i'm just going to power through this i'm going to keep my head down and just i'm not going to acknowledge it and i'm just going to get through it without going through that important step of feeling it we're just going to stuff it down and go and that never works (laughs) yeah i grew up on the east coast and we were taught the same thing but i think it's universal especially for women and men well men aren't allowed to show their emotion either true in a different way, yeah. right? We, I mean, at least we women can occasionally be emotional, but men, it's like they can't be emotional. So everything comes out as anger when the when push comes to shove. Right, we and there's a place for righteous anger, you know, and we need to learn how to like sit with that, you know, but anger when it comes across as abusive, that's, you know, that's another topic. Okay. Yeah, that's a no. Right. That's a no go. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes emotions will mask as other emotions. And more often than not, anger is really a masked emotion for something else. Yeah. There's, you know, this wonderful book called There's Only Two Emotions Love and Fear. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. And I do believe this only two emotions, love and fear. And everything else falls into those two buckets. So when we look at something complex like resentment or anger and break it down to its components, it's like, what are you afraid of losing? What are you afraid of happening? And that's creating this feeling, a false feeling of being anger, of being angry, maybe blaming or resentment. But at the core, we all just, we all just want to be happy. We all want to be good. And Something feels like it's blocking us and there's emotion that comes out about that. It's human, so human. Yeah, and so often underneath that anger is there's hurt. 
Yeah. This is just hurt or reacting out of their wound or sadness or grief. Yeah. Because they're not taught how to feel things. And this is a crusade that I'm on with kids. I'm youth director at my church. I'm a member of a unity church, unity worldwide started in Kansas city, Missouri, I might add, but um, just on a mission to teach kids about it's okay to have feelings. In fact, it's expected. And here's how to deal with those feelings safely. Here's how not to get stuck in them. I wish I'd had something, somebody teaching me that when I was growing up. Yeah. Instead of the opposite, you know, sit and be quiet, be sweet. <laughs> right? Right. Get over it. Just get over it. You're still upset about that. Ah, you're too sensitive. Oh, uh, yeah. The two this and two that's. Oh boy. Oh, and then, oh, yeah. And like, once we realize, okay, we're having this emotion and then we realize, oh, if I continue to have this emotion and I don't deal with it, then it's becoming a block in my system. And then this block in my system is going to block my chi, block my energy, block the flow in my body. Then there's going to be a little dam set up there. And then, you know, that's when the hurt starts. So then unraveling that and catching it, noticing it, seeing these pre little things, you know, first we had the anger and the fear and the sadness that we didn't deal with then all of a sudden we have the shoulder ache or the hip pain or something like that right it's like oh okay I wasn't paying attention right there in what I was experiencing in life and now I've got this pain okay so now I'm going to take this little indication that I haven't been dealing with my stuff and work backwards mm -hmm. absolutely it's being mindful isn't it when we're mindful of our feelings, we're mindful of our reactions, because that's all any of us has any power over is how we how we react. If we can be mindful, I mean, how many times do you go from zero to really angry in traffic or when somebody cuts you off or says something? Whereas if we can be mindful of how you're of how we're feeling, we can maybe dissect it along the way and avoid blowing up, avoid crumbling into tears by just being aware and owning the way we feel. I mean, awareness is so important, right? We just go around numbing ourselves, blinding ourselves instead of sitting with things. I could talk about this stuff all day, Liz. I'm glad. So <laughs> great to have you on the show, Chrissy. This is a great conversation. Let's move into chronic patterns and inherited illness like you talk about in your chapter. Dude, yes. Yeah. So uh, chronic patterns, these are the ones that we're not really mindful of. And many times we've learned them from parents, from teachers, from older siblings, from relatives, from the community, from the media, from TV. We learn these ways of being um gosh how far down the rabbit hole to go go but, far, go far. what's that go far <laughs> go far so we learn these ways of being and responding and think that that's how we're supposed to move through the world because of course we're imitators we are social so we learn things through cues and through social interactions. Um, we learn through osmosis, through people, and think that that's how it's supposed to be. But we can set ourselves up for these chronic loops, these chronic patterns, and these will often begin early in life that we learn from the people closest to us. So for example, when I was growing up, my dad always said, oh, I'm so broke. I'm so broke. And he had a good job and he made really good money. I'm so broke. I'm so broke. When he had a million dollars in the bank and had a really good year. Yeah, but I, I got dead and I'm so broke. And guess what? That was a pattern that got passed down to the kids that we're working on undoing. But this is so typical of many families. We hear these messages growing up that, oh, you just can't trust people. So you got to 
screw them over before they screw you over. We get these messages and those people are, they're not like us. And, you know, all these things that we need to be mindful of, be aware of, where is that showing up for us and how are we dealing with it? But then there's also the familial stuff that gets passed down generation to generation. And the higher self through QHHT has explained this to me and to the, to my clients that um, DNA in our bodies is really just a blueprint, but not the way that we think of it. It's a blueprint of our attitudes, thoughts, and beliefs lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So like I said, our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs all create the energy in our body, or that's what is the energy in our body. Negative emotions, negative thoughts, negative, negative beliefs set up negative outcomes for us. Well, guess what? If we're sitting on those, if we're stuffing them down, if we are passing them on, if we're not dealing with them, they need to be dealt with at some point. And so we might pass in this lifetime, not having dealt with these, but having passed it on to our children, our nieces and nephews, our grandchildren. And in that way that actually lives on. So we can pass these down um, in the form of illness, in the form of what we would consider inherited illness. So for this reason, like for example, my daughter is adopted and she's developing some of the same health issues that I have. And this is true for adopted people that they can develop many of the same issues that their families that they grow up with have because they're swimming in those attitudes. They're swimming in those beliefs. They're taught all of that. And for the same reason, you can have twins who share DNA. They share a common background, but one might just have a naturally better attitude about things and doesn't hold on to things. Whereas the other takes things to heart, is very sensitive. And not that there's anything wrong with being sensitive, but they hold on to things and they don't forgive. And so even two twins can have very different health outcomes just because of their attitudes and the difference in how they see things, how they look at things. So things like diabetes, we think of as inherited. We think of it as genetic. And while yes, it is because it shows up in our genes, it's so much more than that. It's the inherited beliefs that life just isn't sweet, that life is not going to be fair for me. Life is not going to be sweet for me. I can't trust life because, you know, all of this attitudes of um, processing sweetness, that's all in the pancreas. And that's, you know, it's a disease of resistance. We resist sweetness and that's going to show up in our physical bodies um, in the form of diabetes and other things. And again, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm just observe what happens in people and what attitudes result in what physical issues. And there's several resource materials about this too. Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life, has a great appendix at the back of the book that tells you like what's your issue, diabetes, shoulder pain, uh, fibroids, whatever your physical issue is. What is the type of belief that contributes to that? And what are some affirmations that you can say to undo that? What can you do to address that? There's also messages from the body. There's psychological meaning by Dr. Michael J. Lincoln. He was a psychologist and he saw thousands of people with all kinds of different physical issues. And he just noticed that, hey, you know, anger about this or that, that's going to show up in this place in the body. Or these type of dysfunctional attitudes are going to show up like this in the body. And so he's wrote a, written a very comprehensive book, a great resource material to find out, okay, my pinky toe hurts. What's the attitude that goes along with that? And so it's a wonderful resource. And then there's Julia Cannon's, D Dolores Cannon's daughter. She wrote a book called Soul Speak that is based on all of her mother's many thousands of sessions and what comes up in those QHHT sessions, again, cataloging what happens where in the body. It's another resource. So there's many, it's not just me saying this. There's 
other resources out there that also are agreeing with this is how this attitude shows up in the body. And guess what? We get these attitudes passed down to us. It's not just, hey, one day I wake up and I think, oh my God, I resent this. We're taught. It's like things aren't fair. Life isn't fair. Money doesn't grow on trees. People are out to get you. We're taught all of these things and we believe them. So again, all of this stuff is going to show up in the body and then we do not deal with it. If we make it an example for our children, we're going to pass it down. And for that reason, um, our ancestors will sometimes show up for healing. I'm sure you see this with your clients. Yeah. Yeah. When a client comes in for energy work and they bring in a whole entourage. Yeah. And the so family line starts showing up and you're like, okay, you know, it stops with you. Let's do this healing now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'll have relatives show up and go, oh yeah, that. I started that. <laughs> you do want to say that it started with me. And they're like, when you heal it, I get that too. I get that healing too. So when we do heal in the present lifetime, that does serve to heal across the generations all the way back. And I've seen this in hypnosis as well. Like it's introspective hypnosis is a form that I do besides QHHT. It's also very powerful and it's slightly different. But with that, we find out what, what the energy is that's stuck in the body. And sometimes we go back to where it originates. Okay, was this in the current lifetime? Okay, let's go back to when this started. So it might be you're three years old and your friend, best friend was supposed to come over and they didn't come over and you're really upset about that. But then we might look at, okay, so this pattern of like not being able to trust people to do what they say they're going to do. Um, who else shared that? And so we might go all the way back four or five generations to seeing where that originated, heal it, then get the input from that family member, that, that ancestor, why did that start? And why was it so hard to let go of? Well, let's understand that. And then we can clear it. So we'll clear it. Then and we come up and we find that it's cleared in the, in the present day client too. All this stuff is tied together. It's crazy. I love that. That's beautiful. And thank you for pointing that out too, because what we do now just doesn't affect us in our timeline. It affects our generations. There really is no concept of time when it comes to energy. It's all around all at once. It is. It's like that movie, everything, everywhere, all at once. Love it that. really is. Time is not a line like they teach us in third grade. No. As Dr. Who said, it's a ball of timey, wimey, wibbly, wobbly stuff. <laughs> yes which brings us to the next point past lives and I know oh. often when I'm working with my clients past lives come up I had one come up just a couple months ago where this young woman had been hit in the head you know by a horse and it took her out you know tired and headaches and just wasn't feeling herself and her chiropractor referred her to me and we did some cranial sacral work and some other things but a past life came up a past life, you know, that was being mirrored by the hitting of the horse's head in the back of her head where her jaw went forward. In the past life, she was hit by an anvil or an object like that. Same thing. And it's just like talking to that past life, right? Like nice. this is what happened. that was then and this is now. You want to talk a little bit about that and how you work with that? Yeah, absolutely. I've got two really exemplary stories to personify that. One is I had been dealing with this pain between be, behind my left shoulder blade for a long time, on and off, long time. And I went to massage therapy, chiropractors, et cetera. Finally, one day I found the right massage therapist and she was working on me. All of a sudden I had a flashback. I was a man, probably 1700s. I wore a shirt with a roughly kind of thing here. And uh, it was at night, dark night, and it was cold and gross. And I was beating a horse and the horse, because I was angry. Somebody was not doing what they were supposed to do, or I got cheated, or I don't know what, but I was angry. And I was beating this horse and just taking out my anger on it. And it reared up and pulled my shoulder out of the, my arm out of the socket. And I had that flashback, felt the anger, and then I've not had it since. So it hasn't popped up again. 
I think it was just waiting for the right time. And, and I think in some, sometimes people, because people will say, okay, if this is a past life injury and I am relating to it in the current lifetime, why is it waited this long to show up? Wouldn't I be born with it? Not necessarily, not necessarily. So in my case, it could be that I had to experience that type of anger in my current lifetime to connect it. It could also be that I had to be the same age in order to connect to it. For many different reasons, we can have, a, and we can be born into life with these things, but sometimes it shows up later. And sometimes we're just not, still not dealing with the emotion behind it. And a higher self goes, okay, let's give you a flashback because you're just not getting it. And then the other story that I have, this woman came in for QHHT and she was having daily migraines and I get migraines now and they're not fun. I can't imagine having them every day. She was incapacitated. She came in the first time and she had woken up feeling kind of a migraine coming on and she took some medicine. And I said, that's not going to cause you to go like to be too hyper for this session. She says, oh no, this usually doesn't do that for me. It had the opposite effect and knocked her out. And so I had to wake her up and bring her back. But anyway, the second time she came back, she went to this lifetime and she saw a broken bicycle on the sidewalk. Interesting. All right. Well, um, what's around you? She says, I'm in a big city. It's on a sidewalk. There's lots of people coming and going, big buildings, lots of folks. And so tell me about yourself. Look down and how, like, what are you? What are you, how are you dressed? She said she was a boy, about eight to 10 years old. She had um, a paper boy cap on, a jacket, suit. She had knicker pants, like knee pants. And she said, I've got this big bag with newspapers in it. She goes, oh, I'm a newspaper boy. And I said, well, what's in the pa- What's in the news today? Because you never want to ask, like, what is the date? Because that'll bring us into the left brain. It kicks us out of hypnosis, makes us think and makes us be conscious. We don't want to do that. I was like, well, what kind of news is in the paper today? Oh, it's just bad news. Everybody's depressed. Nobody has jobs. Everybody's poor. It's just terrible news. Okay. I had a hard time getting her away from this broken bicycle. It seemed important somehow, and I didn't understand. But I had to go to, I had her go to her home. Her home was an apartment that she had to walk up to get to and not a very nice building. She gets there and there's a mom and a dad and a little baby sister. And I said, well, mom and dad aren't at work. She goes, no, they don't have jobs. Well, can they get a job? No, there's no jobs for anybody. They can't get jobs. So this kid was the only one bringing in any income for a family of four. And so I moved her to an important day and she was at this church and everybody said she couldn't figure out why, but nobody would tell her what was going on. So I moved to her to another important day and she's at this vacant lot and the boys are playing baseball and she wants to play, or they're playing stick ball. She wants to play stick ball with the boys, but she can't get anybody's attention. Nobody's talking to her and nobody's just pay, paying her any attention whatsoever. And I had a thought. So I said, well, let's go to the last day. Let's go to the very last day. She was back at the bicycle. And she told me about looking down at the bicycle and it was definitely broken. And I said, well, where are you seeing this from? Oh, I'm looking down at it. I said, well, where's your body? She said, it's on the ground next to the bicycle. And I realized that she was dead in that lifetime. So she went to the funeral, to her funeral. Nobody had talked to her. Nobody saw her. She went to go play with the boys. Nobody was paying attention to her um, because she was deceased. The boy was deceased. So I brought her out. I brought her out of the trance and we talked about it. And she goes, you know, I saw the whole accident happen. She said, this car came along. It hit her, knocked her off the bicycle and she hit her head. The car hit her head. Where did the car hit or hit your head? I asked. And she said, right, like right here. She pointed to a place on her head. And I said, well, where do your migraines start? And she said that was where her migraines start. So we had a tragic death. We had a lot of emotion around the tragic death. We had fear, um, anxiety. What is my family going to do? How are they going to live? How are they going to survive? So traumatic death plus overwhelming emotion created the 
the atmosphere to where she's going to show up with that in the past, in the next lifetime. She's got to overcome that because remember, emotion is supposed to be felt, moved through the body and experienced so that you can release it. Well, if we have a tragic death with a lot of emotion, we don't have time to resolve it. That is something that we are most likely going to carry forward to the next time. We can carry it forward in terms of phobias and fears. You know, how many of us have fears of, of uh, I live in Missouri for crying out loud. I was born in, Can in Missouri, lived in Kansas most of my life. I'm still in Missouri on the other side. And I am terrified of like deep ocean. Why? Because I know that I drowned by falling off of a ship in a fight and, dr <clears throat> and drowned in the middle of the ocean. So we'll have these fears and phobias that have no explanation and then come to find out they could be from a, another lifetime. Sometimes we'll have birthmarks or birth defects from other lifetimes. Um, and then sometimes we'll have these things that will show up because we never dealt with the emotion from the other life. So we can have illness and, and disease that show up from that. So yeah, knowing about our other lifetimes is very helpful. And Dolores Cannon always said, the most important life that we're living is the one that we're in now, the one where we're focused now. It's interesting to know about other lifetimes we've had, but really that the only reason to, to know that is to know how to live better now. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm great. sure you find that in your clients too. Yeah, definitely. And mm -hmm. beautiful examples. Thank you for sharing those stories. Those are amazing, especially the one where she had passed on, where she had died being hit. Wow, that is amazing. So, you know, I should add too that ever since that session, she never had another migraine. If she started to feel one coming on, she would talk to the little boy that she had been. And she'd say, you know what? You're safe. Everybody's fine. You don't have to worry. They're okay now. And you're okay now. And then the migraine would, you know, the aura, the feeling would just vanish. And it's just as simple as that. That awareness. Awareness is everything. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, it, yeah. Chris, my tagline. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say my tagline is uh, bring awareness to life. Right. Awesome. Yes. Bring awareness to life, everybody. It's a game changer. Christy, this has been awesome to have you on the show. I can't believe an hour has gone already. Oh my gosh. How can people reach you? I am at radiatewellnesscommunity.com. And that is our website. We're on all the social media. Uh, you can find us there as well. Instagram, uh, Twitter. We're not on, we're not on TikTok, not really. And Facebook. So, and YouTube, of course. And then the Radiate Wellness Podcast. The Radiate Wellness Podcast featuring, you're going to be coming up in an uh, upcoming uh, issue or upcoming episode. And you can find the Radiate Wellness Podcast wherever fine podcasts are found. And as on, uh, on YouTube as well. And then I would like to throw in there, I also had the Real Life Angel Encounters podcast for a brief time, 40 episodes. And then I couldn't find enough people to share their real life angel encounter stories. And so I put that one to bed, but episodes are still out there and I'm still gaining new listeners for that. Awesome. I'm going to have to listen to, I've had a couple angel experiences. Man. <gasps> Amazing. Awesome, Christy. And then- one final question. Do you have a jewel of wisdom that you could leave us with today? Oh, I would probably have to say that, um, you know, you've got to feel your emotions, whatever you're going through, allow yourself the grace to, to feel it. And then you'll be able to process it and move on. Thank you so much, Christy. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining Raise the Vibe with Liz. Thank you for having me, Liz. Awesome. And thank you everyone for joining me. Again, I'm Liz Peterson, and this is Raise the Vibe with Liz. You can find me on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram at Raise the Vibe with Liz, and my website, raisethevibewithliz.com. Thanks everybody. And remember to get out there and raise the vibe. Bye. <laughs>